thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for the best paper award. Uh, yeah, my name is Jussi Jokinen. I am from Aalto University, uh, where I am a postdoc in uh, User Interfaces Laboratory, led by Professor Antti Olasvirta. This work is done in collaboration with Center of Human Engaged Computing in uh, Kochi University of Technology, Japan, which is led by Professor Xian C. Ren. Now, my talk is about a long-standing problem in HCI, learning. Even in the previous presentation and in the previous presentation's audience comments, we had to talk about learning, because it's always there when we encounter new interfaces. How do we learn layouts? Every day, or almost every day, we encounter completely new layouts. It can be the ATM, it can be a new website, it can be your air aircraft's uh, entertainment system, or even a new operating system. Now, when you first encounter such a layout, you have to visually search for the element that you are looking for. But as you get more familiar with the layout, you start to just know where the elements are. You can very quickly find the correct element. If we were to understand how this learning occurs, we would be able to design better with learning in mind. We would be able to predict how long uh, it takes for a user to learn a given layout. We would be able to evaluate different layouts for their learnability. Another issue in learning is relearning of partially changed layouts. In my tablet, in the app menu, whenever I install a new app, uh, the app menu slightly changes. Uh, it's not exactly the same as before, and it takes me some time to readjust to re uh, learned positions of the uh, apps. Uh, so if you could understand how this relearning of layouts occurs, again, we would have benefits for design. We could evaluate what kind of uh, reshaping of a layout we can do while still uh, keeping the user with us. So the goal here is to create a model of layout learning so that this model would predict the visual search time when the user is looking for a given element on the layout. Uh, this should be done uh, by generating eye movement patterns on the layout uh, as the user actually moves eyes on the layout. And obviously, we want to predict how learning occurs when the user is ex exposed to the layout, looks for elements on the layout, finds them and uh, this should be visible in decreased search times, and this would be uh, because the visual search patterns, the eye movement patterns, change. Let me show you an example which uh, gives us uh, the requirement for the model. Here is a user, and let's say this is a completely new interface for the user, and let's also say that the user is looking for the uh, bottom left uh, rectangle. Now the user first fixates, that is, moves his eyes on the first uh, element there, encodes the element, that is, makes an internal representation of the element, and then decides that this is not the element that I was looking for. Uh, so what happens is that the user moves his eyes to the next element. This is called a saccade, a fast eye movement uh, between two fixations and again encodes the element, finds out that this is not the element that I was looking for. Now importantly at this point, the user, when he again does a saccade to a new target, he doesn't go back to the first target because he already knows that this is not uh, the target I'm looking for. Uh, so the user is able to inhibit uh, saccades back to uh, targets that have already been encoded. So. The user goes to the next target. Again, this is not the one he was looking for. But now, because these two elements are very close to each other, the user does not need to do another saccade to the fourth element and the actual target. It is close enough for the user to foveate, uh, using his foveal vision to encode the target. And this is obviously faster than having to prepare the uh, saccade jump to the uh, close those elements. And now, 
we want to create a model that can do this, to simulate novice behavior when a user searches uh, uh, a target on a layout. Another example, and uh, please, uh, this is a task for you. Uh, I'm going to show you a QWERTY keyboard, just a traditional QWERTY keyboard, and I'm going to ask you to locate the key S as quickly as you can. No cheating, so you have to fixate on the S here until I uh, present you the keyboard, and then as quickly as possible, locate the key S. Uh, I assume that everybody was really fast with this task because we are all really familiar with the layout. Uh, it, in fact, didn't probably take more than one fixation, uh, two fixation, one second to find the uh, target. So in case you didn't cheat, what happened was that your fixation was about on the letter G in the beginning because that's the center of the screen. Then because you know where to look for the S key, you just did a one saccade jump towards the S key. And again, it doesn't need to be completely on target. You are able to encode uh, keys uh, on other layout elements even if you are not fixating straight on them. And now you were able to find the S. Now we want a model that is able to do the novice behavior and it's able to do the expert behavior that we just saw here. And of course, everything in between those two poles. Uh, the model we created, it's a computational simulation model. It's similar to OCT-R model and EPIC models, um, but it's streamlined towards being uh, used in just layout learning. Uh, this leads the model to be easier, uh, perhaps easier to use and uh, easier to uh, use in this uh, particular context. Uh, it makes the parameter fitting for us a bit easier. There are not that many parameters and most of the parameters that we are using in the model are taken straight from literature. We wanted it to be like this because we want the model to be general uh, we had to fit a couple of parameters that relate to learning, um, but even then, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't have to refit those parameters when we change between different layout contexts. So even if there are no user data for a given uh, design, you should be able to use the model to evaluate uh, the learnability of the design. Uh, the starting point uh, of our modeling work here is keyboard layouts. Uh, it's a good case because keyboard layouts are fairly simple. All the keys are uh, similar. They are rectangles. They are of same size. Uh, they don't vary in color. So it's a clear cut uh, case for us to start with. However, uh, the current work that we are doing extends this model to shapes and sizes and, and uh, colors, etc. cetera. Uh, the model consists of different components. Uh, the first component is vision component. Uh, it's taken from Dario Salvucci's work. Uh, it gives us computation times of uh, encoding a target with our vision. Uh, this time to encode a target depends on, the, uh, on how close the target is to our current fixation. And now if the target is really far from our current fixation, we have to do a saccadic jump, and uh, this model also gives uh, how, uh, us the time how long it takes to uh, do that. Uh, now, in order to inhibit the return of uh, vision to previously encoded objects, we need to have a visual short-term memory component, uh, which takes care uh, of this. So it forces the vision component to always new look for targets it hasn't encoded yet. Now, this could do normal search, this kind of model, but it doesn't yet learn in long term. Uh, for this reason, we add a long-term memory model uh, from John Anderson. It creates association between uh, functions such as keys and their visual locations on the layout. Uh, now, in the very beginning, the long-term storage is, of course, empty for a novice user. But as soon as the novice user starts to find out the elements 
he's looking for, he starts to create associations between the elements and their locations, and the long-term memory starts to uh, build up. And the equations here give us a way to calculate how probable it is uh, for the user to remember the visual location given his exposure uh, to the layout. And it also uh, gives us the time that it takes for this retrieval operation to happen. So you can imagine this model as a race between the visual short-term memory guided attention and long-term memory guided attention. Of course, in the beginning, the visual short-term memory drives the vision uh, towards new targets, but as soon as the long-term memory is able to bring the exact location, the visual location of the target, it obviously uh, then can help the vision module, module in uh, finding the target. Now, in order for the model to relearn partially changed layouts, we need to add a controller, a controller uh, it uses a reinforcement learning model, and the point is that if the long-term memory becomes uh, unreliable because the layout has changed uh, partially, the controller takes uh, care of not trusting long-term memory anymore. It starts to rely on the visual short-term memory again uh, until the long-term memory creates the new associations uh, of the new, uh, new layout or the changed layout, and then the controller can again go back to the uh, long-term memory guided search. Uh, we tested the model with uh, participants who had to spend five days learning a completely new keyboard layout. Uh, then we simulated the same kind of learning behavior uh, and predicted the uh, decrease of visual search times as uh, users or the model uh, learn the locations of the keys. Now, you can use this kind of understanding, for example, in comparing different kinds of layouts. I've here simulated what happens if you have just a small or even a very tiny layout that you have to learn. Uh, in QWERTY, the visual search time is beginning at about 1.2 seconds, and then they uh, go down. In five hours, they go down to about uh, 0.6 seconds. Uh, but for smaller keyboards, uh, the initial search times are obviously faster and, and uh, of course, you don't get such a drastic learning curve uh, because, because the layout is already easier to manage. Uh, what the model can also do is if you ask what happens if you change some keys on, the, on a familiar layout, such as if you swap these keys on the QWERTY, uh, we simulated uh, how the model first in the blue curve learns the QWERTY layout to be a very good uh, finding keys on the QWERTY layout. Then we swapped some of the keys, and you can see on the red curve, there is an in initial impact, a negative impact on the search times. But because of the reinforcement learning component, the model can reclaim expertise uh, with the uh, layout. So now you can use this functionality, for example, to predict uh, what is the impact of different layout changes on the user's uh, visual search. We have here a Dvorak keyboard, uh, and uh, the model is first trained to be very expert on QWERTY. Uh, in the bottom, we see 0 0.4 seconds average search times on QWERTY. Then the model is given Dvorak keyboard, and you can see that the initial impact on the visual search times is uh, relatively large, and then there uh, happens the relearning. Uh, then we use the same model for uh, evaluating SAT keyboard, and you can see the SAT keyboard is a bit slim, similar to QWERTY keyboard, and in fact the point was to create a similar QWERTY keyboard, familiar to QWERTY users, but uh, with maybe a bit uh, more optimized layout. And you can see that compared to Dvorak, the SAT keyboard uh, does fare better in the initial, with the initial impact on visual search times. Then you could even, even uh, ask what happens if I do only a slight change. And here we have uh, from last year's guy uh, the IJ QWERTY keyboard where you just swap I and J. And you can see in the green 
line, which is very close to the uh, 0 0.4 second line, that the initial impact of just swapping I and J is very small, and the model is uh, relatively quickly at the points where it uh, left off with QWERTY keyboard. Now, in summary, the model is a tool uh, for uh, solving certain kinds of design problems such as if you are if you're given different layouts and you have to predict how uh, much the user uh, searches uh, spends searching for the elements in the beginning uh, how quickly the user can learn the layout uh, you can do that uh, and again you can also uh, use the model to predict the immediate impact of a partial layout change and then predict how the user reclaims expertise on that layout. Um, thank you. You can find the model either by sending me an email and asking or on the website of, of the project. Um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. It was a nice talk. Uh, I had a question about the model. Do you, uh, is it possible to take into account some of the structures that users might be familiar with? Uh, so, so for example, you did QWERTY and then you did IJ QWERTY. So the QWERTY is a familiar uh, uh, keyboard and therefore uh, that kind of applies. So for example, if I was to compare, uh, say a perfectly random keyboard with the alphabetic keyboard. So people may not be, generally familiar with the alphabetic key, uh, specific layout of the alphabetic keyboard, but uh, they yeah. will probably go faster with the alphabetic keyboard than yeah. the random one. Uh, that's a pertinent question. Um, the model as it is presented on the paper doesn't do that, but it's fairly simple to extend it to these kinds of top-down strategies that you have. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's something that this model doesn't do, but which is we, we are planning on okay. um, executing. Hi, uh, Chris Jans from Utrecht University, the Netherlands. Very nice work. Thank you. Um, I was interested about um, um, the, the opportunity for expansion of the model. Uh, so you got, uh, it's really nice that you put in other parts of the equation of this behavior, like the learning, including the long term. Um, motor action seemed to not be involved yet, so the, the actual finger movement. Yep. So I can imagine that at this level of abstraction, uh, that that's perhaps not needed yet to include that, or maybe you differ on it, so I'd like to hear your yeah, thoughts um, on that, and then I'll, I'll add the second question to it, because they're a little yeah, sure, um, So the, the second part is, um, how would you extend it uh, to have uh, a diversity of users? So particularly I was thinking about people with a visual disability who uh, uh, perhaps or have one blind side in their, their vision? Yeah. Like a scotoma, would, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, two important questions. Uh, first of all, the extendability. Yes, it's fairly simple to extend the mode, for example, to have mouse cursor movement or finger movement by, for example, applying Fitch law. And the controller can then take care of uh, moving eyes and then moving the finger. Obviously, you're running the problems of parallelism when you type on a smartphone. Do you first locate the key and then move your finger, or do they move partly in parallel? So it might get complex, but sure, it's, uh, it's extendable to that direction. On the individual differences, um, yes, uh, as long as the parameters of the model can be related to individual abilities, uh, such as uh, vision, we can model individual differences. Let's take a person with bad visual acuity uh, so they have to, uh, for example, fixate longer on a target in order, order to encode it, or they cannot fixate, uh, they cannot encode targets that are not really close to their fixation. We can just by uh, manipulating one parameter uh, simulate that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a nice extension there. If you um, people have some some form of vision loss, uh, there's all kinds of ways that we that we. Um, <coughs> compensate for our vision loss typically with different glasses, but I, I think this would be a software-based uh, intervention where you could find the optimal resolution or the optimal placement. So yeah, that would be great. And yeah. yep. Good, thank you.